I'm giving you different ways of looking at this problem, which are all unsettling, by the way. Um, uh, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, yeah, and the last one, I'll, this is a very important one, which is easy to do. Place high priority on keeping the northern section of Four Mile River watershed undeveloped so its groundwater supply will be available as a future drinking water supply. Appropriate lands are listed in our open space report, report which is part of the uh, POCD. If you look at Four Mile River, and if you look on your map, there are one or two, you'll see, uh, it doesn't show the open space, but if on the open space plan it does. They're up the northern end, there's some open spaces there. And the good thing about that is, the uh, impermeable surface in that watershed is only about three and a half percent, which says, gee, this is the normal amount of impermeability that exists because of ledges and so on. Now, if, as long as the National Guard camp has not made a mistake, we have a source of about, I checked with Brad Cargill, anywhere from 300 to 500,000 gallons per, what is it, hour or minute or whatever it was, the, the, the flow rate. So what I envision, and the good other part is, it's north of I-95. Okay, so any spill along 95 would not affect that. Okay, and what we envision is, and I don't, we don't want to get into running the water department, but that would be uh, we would secure as much of that open space as possible, and then uh, this is an engineering suggestion: uh, put a well in and hook it up, ready to go if we ever needed it. There it was. And at least it's 400,000 gallons that we could get out of there, okay? Um, and I think I have it. Oh, my last line is, uh, that is the end or the beginning. <laughs> we'll open it up to a few questions. Um, if there's any glaring questions that need to be tidied up. <coughs> As you know, I'm chairman of the Water and Sewer Commission yep. as well. Sat on there for many years. <clears throat> well, I think um, under recommendations, uh, the next to the last one, the hazard mitigation plans, th this is something that we've talked about before. You wrote a letter regarding that to mm -hmm. the state, and you also brought it up at the Council of Governments. And I think we have to keep harping on that, particularly with um, the plans for reconstructing the roadway around uh, the around exit 74 and um, right. around that yep. area, yep. which is going to r markedly increase the amount of impervious surface that uh, we have in that area, which of course feeds into our <coughs> into the <coughs> Patagansett <coughs> River. And um, you're right, right, and we will continue to push that for sure. <coughs> Um, you know, we do a good job with these big parking lots because they have to put in some pretty significant stormwater uh, treatment um, facilities. Um, Stop and Shop started that, I think, with a big, big uh, stormwater thing. Of course, Costco does too. But, um, but the highway is just glaring. It's not just the highway, well, it's, it's all these roads. It's, it's the roads that go through think town. about the, uh, remember the accident, the horrid one about 10, 15 years ago? Yeah. And three people killed. Right. 8,000 gallons of diesel fuel. The only thing that was good about the whole thing was it went into the Niantic River, hmm. which is bad for the Niantic River, but at least it could dilute it and it didn't get our supply. If that had been a quarter mile west. Hmm. Well, I think it's not. You, you get the point. It's the size of the parking lots in the more recent developments and the number of cars that those parking lots can accommodate that drag in hmm. pollutants. Yeah. The uh, dirt in the tires, the runoff from no doubt. oil. And, and, well, and that's the 10% mm -hmm. degradation that comes along with impermeable surface. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting too because uh, I remember talking to some junkyard owners, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Congdon up in Salem. He said back in the 50s, you'd put them in the junkyard, and what you do is get underneath the car, undo the uh, oil uh, plug and the plug for the uh, antifreeze, and just let it into the ground. That's what everybody did. And and when he sold the property, there was an extensive cost for mitigation. And one of the things, too, that I liked uh, that you point out uh, in here, too, is about the use of salts, because obviously we all see them 
and they even have that liquid treatment they do now prior to a storm. Yeah. When the precipitation hits and it washes off the side of the road, that sodium is in there. You've basically got a low concentration of salt water yes. that goes in there. And we all can remember the time when it was a little bit of salt mixed with sand. Yep. But they don't do that so much anymore. And I, and I do understand you have more cars out, you're worried about people's safety and so forth like that. I understand mm -hmm. all that. But I think that's a good point because uh, you do see some areas on highways throughout different parts of uh, you know the country and that where you'll see reduced salt use ahead, which yep. means yep. Every not as much. Every state that we, I looked at has a plan. Nobody has a good plan, but they're all working. The, the best, the least you can do is uh, don't put it on level stretch. You know, don't, you pick the slipperiest spots and apply it there. That's about the only way. There, there, there's nothing magic. Well, and sadly right now that hill coming down from exit 73 to exit 74 is an area where you'd probably put yeah. more salt, no, no. Right. which is where we're very concerned about any type of yeah. spill. So. It's a struggle. <clears throat> but, I, you know, I, I do like the, you know, the, that, that considering that last one about, FMR and that whole area out there. Fortunately, we, with the National Guard camp there, we've got almost a, a little bit of a national boundary in there right now, too. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you did a lot of work and a lot of effort yeah. went into this. So. It was very fortunate for us because that extends into all lines. Oh, as yes, well. I know. Yeah. A lot of forest land there, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. It seems like our most pro highest producing wells are the southern wells. Um, interesting. I was gonna, that's what I was going to say when I was bringing up the water and sewer. That the more northern wells, um, um, I'm thinking off of Patagansett Lake. I'm thinking when we tried to put one at Darrow Pond, we couldn't get a lot of water water out of them. Oh no, the, the watershed's not big enough. Yeah, that would be. Yeah. I give you an even harder, worse example. If you try to put one at Clark's Pond, because mm. the watershed at Clark's Pond is a you know an eighth of a mile on each side of Clark's Pond. Yeah, yeah. There's no watershed. Right, you know, right. Okay, that's what makes that's what makes Patagansett. Well, there's a lot of, I, I, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of watershed. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that's yeah. what you, and that's where we want to put the open spaces, right? You right. got to tie this together, and that's why I brought up. The, you may have heard if you talked to Brad that the Water and Sewer Commission has looked at the Fort Mile River as a potential uh, well yeah, site. The, the, you can look at it, but you've got to secure that open space. That's. That's yeah. what this recommendation is. Right. No, no doubt. No. There's a lot of, lot of pieces to the jigsaw to the puzzle. Open space but plan. Are, right. There it is. And you see which ones it is. Right. Okay. Right. What, yeah, what I think we're going to have to do is have the land trust and the town have to work together on this. We're pretty good at writing, yeah. uh, writing proposals. Mm -hmm. uh, the town is going to have to start putting a water tax on to secure this land to protect the next 50 years. Period. I have a question. Yes, sir. I have a concern. Um, so you were mentioning Stones Ranch. Yes. And uh, I know they used to have an airstrip up there. I don't know if they yes. still do. I think they still do, yes. And if that's the case, uh, do they st still house firefighting apparatus yes, that no. has uh, that foam? I, I, I think we should know that. No, I don't know, but that's exactly the kind of question that should be asked. I think we need to know that, and I think we need to get the state of Connecticut involved if they do. Yes. Yeah. Because if they had an occasion to use that foam, that pollution would travel all the way exactly mm -hmm. exactly and as you say it doesn't that stuff doesn't go away no and my that's, yeah that's my, my thought would be then probably every fire department has some type of foam i know our state fire departments have some foam. but it's it's a real yeah it's a it's a it's a real danger well, well i know one we of the concerns to, was if they if they had had to use that at the the gate is uh, fortunately they did fortunately they did not have to do that and I know the fire departments way, are very concerned about using yeah. that too, so that's at least a little bit. That's, that's my comment. What, is the, what would the regulatory process be to um, expand the aquifer protection area? Is that something the town legally can do? Yes. Or the, or the state? Yes. State? So yes. as long as we meet the state guideline. Uh, and it's it, pretty current, wide open. The current definition. They're pretty the wide open. It. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And what that means is, <coughs> there's 13 things you can't do. In that, in the aqua, I mean, one of them is a steel mill, which what we wouldn't do anyway. But you, you get the point. Mm -hmm. It's, every, you know, in this business, <laughs> almost everything is better than nothing. You know, if we get started a, a, a new, 
a hundred years ago, it would be a lot slicker. Right. We're playing catch-up ball, right? Always, always. Uh, the other w last thing I want to say is, I, I mentioned public drinking water supply, but more than half the people have private wells. Well, the same thing belongs, they're mm -hmm. concerned with how the water gets to their private wells. Mm -hmm. Let's take the ladder of Brook watershed. There's not an aquifer there big enough to have a public well. That's the, pro that's the problem. But you know what? That water, where does that water come from? It comes from uh, Darrell Pond. It comes from the land that the land trust just, the 330 acres of the Cavs property. We, if we can pull those off, we're sending clean water into Latimer's Brook, which somebody is drinking, see? So we can't just focus on the public yeah. supply. It's the private supply is subject to the same forces. So you have a lot of new information for you. It's been our pleasure to do it. Thank you, Art. Thank you to the... I think Mark has a question. Yes. Yeah, just, sure. just the second time I heard it, but um, also interesting in there, if you look at the tree filters, we've put some of those in around town. Yeah. They seem to be doing well. Um, once again, it's better than nothing. Yep, yep. And, and people, I've heard people say, it's 100%. No, it's not 100%. No, no, no. It's better than nothing. Catch us the beginning phase. Okay. Of the, yep. Okay. In fact, that has to all be coordinated. We really have to have a big discussion about how do we integrate tree filters and the whole water thing. That's what this should start. I have one other question. Yes, um, I'm sorry. How long does it take for rainwater, for instance, to permeate the surface, uh, surfaces and get down into the recharge area of the aquifer. Okay, well, it, it's, it takes us, it's a matter of hours because when the raindrop hits the surface, which is the rain, it, it, depending on how porous it is, within an hour you're, you're, you're at least a foot down. Yeah. Okay. How porous it is and how saturated it is based on the right. volume of rain. Yeah. And how much, how much yeah. we're pulling too. Yeah, oh, well, it depends yes, on and the, the interesting yeah. question, how about when it's frozen? It never gets down, then it runs off. So um, I met with uh, Brad Cargill, and we, we were talking about the salt. Mm -hmm. Did you mention yep. the salt? And uh, obviously there's some natural salts in the ground, and then there's also some of the salts that we put on the roads. And what's interesting is you could actually, you could actually see the increase of salt levels you know, mm -hmm. during the year. Mm -hmm. And then if you have a really wet year, or, um, or if you have a, well, if you have a really wet year, you'll see it flush out, and you'll see the levels go down. If you have a really bad winter, you'll see, that, you'll see a little increase. And it seems to be a slight trend up. That's well, but it, uh, but it that, does that, flush. If that's that's in there, the, yeah. You know, the, uh, the, uh, the salt level. But the the point is, the magic words are: we want to keep as maximum volume flowing south. Yeah, to flush. That's that's it. Because that helps the flush. Well, if it goes an inch a day, we don't care. It's going in the right direction. Mm. It's really what we've got. The, the sodium it's issue is a real issue, and it's trend. Mm -hmm. It's been trending up over the yeah. decades, yep. and it's not going away. And it's hitting some dangerous numbers. It has been already. You mentioned senior citizens shouldn't be drinking the water. It's true. It's not just sea slime water. It's, it's East Coast water. Well, no, that's um, yeah. It's, everybody. It's, it's everybody, and we're we're having this, you know. And there's a there's a balance, right? Because we got to salt the roads. Uh, we got to save lives on the roads. Yeah. Um, you, the, I feel like I'm walking on just chalk, walking into some of our school buildings because we salt the. Mm -hmm. mm. We sell the heck out of it, but we've also been sued quite a number of times for people slipping. Um, and people have gotten hurt, broken hips, and broken legs. So there's this yeah. public safety, personal well, safety, and, and the assault. But I, I, there's got to be an alternative. And well, with struggle, the humankind comes up with solutions. Well, and I, I think, and hopefully, there'll be some kind of a solution. A good job, I think, on that is the uh, what's the big lake in uh, New York State? One of the Boston? Finger Lakes? Pardon me? One no. of the Finger Lakes? Sure. No, no. No, I, the big one they pulled all the water from for New York City. As you come in the oh. Mass Turnpike, uh, uh, Champlain. Oh. No, not Champlain. No, not Champlain. That's what the heck is it? Near Albany. What's the big lake near Albany, New York? Oh, Lake George. Lake George. Yeah. Lake George oh, really? has, a, has a very deep scientific program to make Lake George clean. Mm. Okay? What I suggest is, as water board chairman, you... I, I've got addresses you, you could call mm. and see what they've done. They've done a lot of work 
Just on road salt. Mm. Okay. But anyway, that's great. Um, Mr. Nixon, my, might I have a point of personal privilege? Yes, you may. Okay. Yes, uh, ma'am. You've been working at this some time, Mr. Cross. Could you tell us what the what the year what the first year was that you were appointed to a board or commission? I think it was 1970, and I was I can tell you uh, when I got on the conservation commission, I was astounded. All we talked about was squirrels and birds, and I thought, and they would really talk about there was a dead bird in my yard, and it was. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy talk. And um, out of that, I, I saw, guess what? I got to be the chairman because I wanted to talk about more than the birds. And um, it was still very primitive. But I can tell you one thing we did. We were the first conservation commission in the state of Connecticut to adapt the Inland Wetlands Law, this town, okay? I was the first with Mike, our commission, the first in the state of Connecticut. There's a humor story with that. Does Russell Brenneman, does that mean, name mean anything to you? Russell Brenneman was a very active, prominent land use lawyer. He was Dan Lufkin's first legal counsel when the deep was formed, okay? And he helped write, in fact, the charter for the land trust. Well, when I took over, I said, What's, we want the Inland Wetlands Law. We, we want to pull that off or do it. I got calls, man, you're going to go to jail, you're going to be sued. I mean, it was, I thought, what the hell did I just do? Mr. Clever ain't so clever. So I called up Russell and I said, Russell, what is, they tell me I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. He says, Art, don't worry about it. I'll get you out of jail within 24 hours. And I thought, that didn't help one bit. <laughs> So since 1970, have you had a year off from oh, yeah, order yeah, commission? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I believe in the 70s you were planning commission. And no, I no, I was always conservation. Oh. I was oh. busy with the land trust. Then I left that after 10 years because I got to be Art Carlson's land trust, and that's not good for business, for well, my business or the land trust business. But anyway. Well, thank you. Your You're service welcome. since 1970 is what makes this town great, that we have so many people well, that, that volunteer to give their time, the thank including you. commission yeah. members. Mm -hmm. yep. well, so, thank you. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Art. Thanks. Very nice report. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, I'll just add to the whole also, look. It's a nice whole uh, look. commission. Nice. Also, my understanding, we were one of the first towns to adopt the aquifer protection regulations and zoning. Right. So Early zoners, too. We were, yeah. Right. yeah. You, you guys that are used to be on zoning, make sure you take credit for as much as possible. Zoning, well, that was done before my time. Zoning, time. zoning but. and more zoning. <laughs> um, point, uh, are there appointments yeah, just still one. outstanding? Just so one. I, we might be cleaning up this part of our business, which is nice. Actually, this January. is just uh, the new fire marshal has, uh, you know, has a, yes. wants to bring someone on. So I move to appoint Robert DiGitano of 260 Boston Street, Boston, to serve as Deputy Fire Marshal for the Town of East Lyme through January 3rd of 2022. And this is upon the request and recommendation of our new Fire Marshal. I believe his resume is in your packets right. this evening. If you have a chance to peruse it, he's uh, well qualified and I'll, I'll trust anything that the Fire Marshal, you know, if the Fire Marshal wants to bring uh, a part-timer on. Um, uh, of course, they have a, a, a stable of part-timers and we fill shifts as needed. And frankly, we need to build that up a little bit. So, second, um, it's been seconded. We have a motion that's been seconded. Um, it's your pleasure. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? I'll abstain. Okay, yes, ma'am. Anything else? If not, we'll go to executive session, and this is where we got to clear the room. I'll move to uh, enter into executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel issues. Okay, clear personnel issues. Gonna come back and do one thing and get in our way ourselves. So, is there a second? Your motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Terrific. Okay, I'll move to exit out of executive session <coughs> with no action taken. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
We are back in regular session now. Discussion and possible action of the unaffiliated group agreement. I'll move to approve the East Lyme unaffiliated group salary and benefits portion of their agreement with the town attached here to as exhibit one. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Ex officio reports. <coughs> you caught the change of that word. I said it uh, of their agreement with the town vice. What you had? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So Mark, I'll start if you want. Sure. The, thanks. Um, I didn't get a chance to go to the POCD meeting. I had four meetings that week, uh, but they met on Wednesday. You saw there's been some articles. We've been getting some good press about it. Um, they did have a very good turnout on the uh, survey. Over 500 respondents. That's great. Um, so I think they're very pleased with that. They're moving on to the next phase, which is going to be the public forums. I think it's the 29th coming up. Um, so if you're going to go. We may want to just make sure that if there's more than three of us, we may want to agenda possibly. Which which meeting? Sorry. Um, the when is it? It's the 29th at seven here. That's a public. So it's, it's, it's an open forum. Open forum. Check in with Sandy if you're going to be there, and <coughs> we can post an agenda if we're going there to listen. We may not. And, and it's yeah. not official so it's, um, yeah, selectman business, so we can be there in the audience. Okay. Um, but 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 if if, if it's it'd be more comfortable to post an agenda, that will. But it would be a good opportunity for you to hear, you know if, if you want yeah. to hear what the town residents say. Um, so that that's what's going on there. Um, I think the chair is going to the COG for a planning meeting uh, next week of planning commission. You see, you know, I think there's a council of governments planning meeting or something like that. You familiar? You know? Okay. I think there is. I think it's COG. Probably the planners going. Yeah. No, no, no it's planners, and the chairman is going to go oh, okay. too. He's been invited, so. Okay. Um. Anyways, um. Lastly, uh, building commission met. Um. They're well on their way. They're pretty much wrapped up with almost everything. They have a few holdbacks um, that they're waiting on, uh, some items, and they're kind of waiting to see what all the numbers come in on. It was probably the last meeting the architect will be there. Um, and there's very, very few items. Uh, the budget's looking uh, pretty good. They're going to um, see where they're at with the final numbers to see what they can afford for the holdbacks. Um, but other than that, there's just been a few little tweaks of some of the um, air conditioning units and stuff like that. But other than that, I think it's been, been a success. So. Is it? Terrific. Uh, Mrs. Hardy? Well, we heard from the Commission of Natural Resources uh, tonight, and that has been on their agenda, and they've been working on that for over a year. So that was uh, the culmination. And um, from time to time, I hope maybe you'll do a little nighttime reading, keep it by your bedside table, because it's a lot to absorb all, all in one reading. Uh, they really worked very hard on it, and there is, as Mr. Carlson said, there is a lot of scientific backup uh, in there, and there are, I think, several uh, recommendations that we, they would need our support on to follow up on, as well as planning and also zoning. Uh, Zoning Commission um, approved the Village Overlay District for Downtown Niantic. I had thought that there'd be a very large turnout for the public hearing that preceded their vote. Uh, there were two um, local residents who spoke, one who was very opposed and then one, one who felt that there should be a little bit of tweaking and then it would be um, more, shall we say, palatable for some of those who were opposed. Mm -hmm. uh, Commission on Aging, again, increasing demand for their services, particularly for transportation. And uh, one of the things that they talked about was uh, trying to get more volunteer drivers, particularly to drive uh, patients to doctor's appointments. And um, I expressed a concern about that for individual liability. Uh, particularly for people who weren't well enough to drive themselves. I think that that's a lot of responsibility to put on a private citizen to use their own vehicle. And um, it's not like delivering meals on wheels where you go to somebody's house, drop off the food, perhaps visit for a few minutes, 
as opposed to transporting people in your own private vehicle. And uh, so they're going to think about perhaps some other ways around it. Basically, uh, if they're going to continue that service, then I think that they're going to have to have another vehicle and another driver. I just think it's too much to ask individuals to uh, put themselves on the line for this, so to speak. Uh, any, uh, unless we wanted to in some way ensure these drivers that town, yeah. town right. insurance would cover them, yeah, I, I think too. that's another liability. I think it would be better for us to get another vehicle and use a town employee as the driver. So I'll keep you posted on that, but it's a continuing concern that they are rapidly not being able to meet the request for that service. Um, TVCCA, uh, it was a meeting not of the commission, but uh, with the director uh, to talk about uh, some suggestions for improvement for the food service and that's basically it. Thank you, Mrs. Hardy. Okay, uh, Parks and Rec met, met last week. Uh, one of the things they discussed is fees for this upcoming year for entrance to the park. Uh, they're going to probably leave, they're going to leave the uh, resident uh, fee for the most part where it is at forty dollars. They're looking at increasing the uh, out of town season pass and the out of town day pass uh, up a little bit. They haven't come up with a, a number yet. They're also going to increase the uh, cost for uh, uh, renting of the, uh, for uh, not, not for town residents, but for non-residents for the uh, tent as well as the uh, pavilion. So uh, it's still a uh, bargain, uh, an extreme bargain. They went up last year and there was, not, there was never a question as to, to the use of it or anything like that too. So uh, one of the things they did decide to do is uh, uh, when the Hartford uh, triathlon comes in now right now we have never charged them for the use of the tent or the pavilion which they use but the policy says if a nonprofit is using it this is the cost so they uh, approve the request for the triathlon this year but there will be a cost for the use of the tent on the night before and the day of the triathlon mm -hmm. same thing with the the pavilion um, that and that's about it um, they've talked a little bit about the Miracle League field they hope to break ground uh, in, you know, in the um, March or April time frame. They're hoping to be done by the end of the, uh, uh, the, the season, at the end of the uh, season, you know, the fall before it gets cold again. So uh, they've raised enough money to do phase one and start on phase two. So that's going really well. And uh, that's about it for Parks Rec. I'm sure they're talking to the school about coordinating construction activities and school activities. Oh yeah, that's yeah. That's why they, they know that obviously, if they're going to have people in there for construction, they're going to since they're going to be accessing through the school area, they're going to have to have, you know, be vetted and so forth like that. But I think just the groundbreaking. I think most of it is planned for <coughs> similar to what they'll be doing with Well One A and uh, Six when they start working on uh, those. They'll be done during the uh, the break time. Uh, also, uh, the fences have been done at the Little League field. Now they're working at Vets. There's a backstop at the uh, Little League at the uh, field at Vets where. Bob Fanner, the chair of uh, Parks and Rec, said he's been there since he was a child playing ball. So he wants, when that's removed and the new one put in, he wants to be able to take that home with him because it, oh it goes way back with him. So, but <laughs> uh, going to take home backstop? A little bit of the backstop, just a teeny piece. Oh, of okay. It. You know, like you know, like a square from yeah, a parquet yeah. floor. So, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah.